Here is tonight's agenda. We're going to do some introductions of myself and Ty, and then we're going to do a presentation. There's going to be some questions and answering portion, and then our final thoughts. So we're going to kick it off with the introduction, starting with myself. Um, my name is Alita Hall. I am the owner and founder and CEO of AMH Bookkeeping Services, Bookkeeping LLC, Accounting Services, all of the above. And... Um, I got into this field when I was in high school. I just needed a math elective. Lo and behold, I found my career path. So I've kind of been dealing with, you know, the accounting and bookkeeping portion since like mm, early 2001. So it's been about 20 years. Um, and I started my business four years ago because I felt like in my day job, I wasn't making the level of impact that I wanted to make in reaching people and letting them know just how important bookkeeping is to the overall financial health of their business. Um, a couple of fun facts about me. I am a fraternal twin. We look absolutely nothing alike, but if you heard us on the phone, you wouldn't be able to distinguish the two of us. Um, yes, Marvel movies are my jam i haven't missed a single one and i really do like too much cream in the coffee it's kind of bad you guys like really bad <laughs> my boss makes fun of me for it and so um i'm going to briefly turn it over to ty so he can introduce himself to you and tell you a little bit about what he does and what brought him here okay well my name is ty green and I am the founder and lead curriculum designer for my company, which is the Green Business Center. But my main company that I use primarily is called Thailand Bookkeeping Systems, as you can see in the background. But I'm covering that, <laughs> so to speak. But pretty much a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the accounting profession now for over 20 years, about 21 years to be exact. Um, I have been a corporate accountant from staff level to a senior accountant. And in my accounting functions, I have performed various accounting duties uh, consisting of financial statement preparation, budgeting, payroll. So pretty much all aspects of accounting I have dealt with. But Accounting is something that I love to do. Um, I find it interesting to be able to see how finances work because I was always a money guy ever since I was um, a little kid. But outside of accounting, I'm also an adjunct instructor. I teach accounting and business courses on pretty much I teach financial accounting, um, I teach also computerized accounting and QuickBooks. So teaching is also something that I enjoy doing. And the reason why I started teaching is because I want to teach individuals how to use QuickBooks effectively. Uh, QuickBooks can be a great bookkeeping tool. It can be a great tax preparation tool as long as it is set up correctly. So that is something that I enjoy doing. A few fun facts about me. Prior to COVID, <laughs> I enjoy traveling, going on cruises. That's what I love to do the most. Um, even though I'm currently living in Georgia, I am from Philadelphia, and I'm a huge Philadelphia sports fan, more specifically the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm happy with our draft pick last night, Devontae Smith. Looking forward to good things. <laughs> Looking for the Eagles to, to, you know, do well, get back into the winning tradition. So that's what I love. And more specifically, I have a dry sense of humor. I can make people laugh when I want to. Not all the time, but when I want to. <laughs> Every now and then. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Ty, for telling us about yourself. And I did see your post about the Philadelphia Eagles and the draft picks, and I was laughing. I'm like, he's hardcore, for real. So <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> All right, so let's get on to our main show. This presentation has been, like, 
a tug on my soul. Like I had to get it out here. And I want to let you guys know, like I felt so strongly about this presentation that I'm going to give that when I talked to my mastermind about it, that they told me I came across as a little hostile because I get really, I get really passionate about these things. And that is not my intent today. Hostility tends to make people feel very judged and very uncomfortable. And that is not my intent. So I am sorry if my passion comes out, but it is not the intent of this. It's just to inform you about what bookkeepers want small business owners to know, because sometimes you just don't know that this is what the phenomenon is. And so it is my goal to leave you with a better understanding of the position that an MVB, most valuable bookkeeper, can play when they're on your team. I like that. I like that. So let's get into our top 10. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> the first accurate and organized financial data is necessary. I put necessary in capital letters because to your business, this stuff is like oxygen. Okay. You will not get very far if your financial data is not accurate or organized. Um, it, it creates what's called a cash flow hemorrhage. And that means you have money going everywhere and you have no idea where it's going or where it's coming from. And you are getting behind on bills and you feel stressed out. And so it's, it's just like you're just free fall bleeding. And so accurate financial data is crucial to your business. It is the lifeblood. And as a bookkeeper, it is my job to keep my finger on that pulse. So if there is something coming up, if, if I see a, a slit in your financial wrist, I can, I can bandage it before it becomes too bad. So I am like your business's first responder. Okay. That MVB, you want me on your team. We catch those images before they become tax problems before they become, you may have to file bankruptcy. So accurate and organized financial data is crucial. If you miss and misunderstand Anything else that is said in this presentation, do write this fact down. Remember it. It is vital. You cannot make proper decisions without it. Am I going too fast? Do I need to slow down? No. Nope. Sounds good. Okay, good. Um, if there's any questions, please stop me. Raise your hand. I'm sure Ty can see you. And, you know, just let us know. If you got questions, I'll answer them during the middle and also at the end as well. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Ty. Did you have any questions on that first slide or any comments? No. Well, <laughs> this is what you said right here. The first slide kind of nails it all. Um, I can't think of how many times that, you know, in the class I taught this to my students and I've even encountered this on some small business clients that I work with. Accuracy and organization is the key. Because without accuracy and organization, everything would just be all over the place. And that is one key factor in being an effective bookkeeper is to be accurate and organized of the financial data. So, yes, you, you hit the nail right on the head with this, this first point. All right. Thank you. And you're absolutely right. Things will be in complete disarray. I'm sure we have all seen that metaphorical office desk cluttered with files and receipts and just things all over the place. So absolutely. Um, next up on our slate, bookkeeping is key to properly maximizing your tax deductions. It really is because without your bookkeeping, you can't get a tax deduction because they will not take estimations. I repeat, they will not take estimations. Round numbers, like let's say you had $1,500 in advertising spend and that's what you wrote, but that's not exactly what your bookkeeping would say. Anything ending in perfect round zeros is a flag to the IRS because they know price points don't add up like that. Some instances they do, but if they see it across your whole return, you're triggering yourself for an audit. You don't want those. They're intrusive <laughs> and sometimes a bit scary. So bookkeeping is vital. It's key to properly maximizing those tax deductions. The better and more organized your financial records are, the easier it will be for your tax preparer to go in and print that profit and loss statement, see all your business expenses laid out, 
prepare your tax return and get you every single deduction that you are entitled to. They may even find some because of new tax laws that you weren't aware of or your bookkeeper, because we can miss things like that sometimes. Our fingers aren't on tax laws. We get that information from our tax repairs that we network with. So they might even catch some new ones that are coming down the pipe for you. So definitely bookkeeping is how you get those maximized without a doubt. Ty, your Amen. thoughts? Amen. And one of the, like we was uh, saying uh, prior to us going live, one of the main tax deductions that I see overlooked often is fixed assets. You know, you buy computers, you buy all types of equipment, you know, and the big thing about those computers and other equipment is that they depreciate. Depreciate depreciation in and of itself is a pretty big tax deduction. But a lot of that is overlooked because a lot of small business owners don't report their, you know, any type of major purchases that they buy, you know? And I don't know the tax law probably changed. You can uh, correct me on this, Alita, but I know um, the IRS offers, I mean, I know before it was up to a five, $500,000 deduction on first $2 million worth of assets that you buy, that you purchase for your business. I don't know, that may have changed, but just in my experiences alone, you know, depreciation is one of the many tax deductions that are missed because it's not reported. You're absolutely correct on that. Um, uh, there's a lot of, because they don't know. It's simply because you didn't know. Um, right. You didn't know that you could elect to take a higher portion of depreciation on your fixed assets in your first year of putting them into your business, of putting it into operation. So this is where it comes from. It's one of those things you didn't know that you didn't know. I didn't know that that was a deduction I could take when I started my business four years ago until I had a tax preparer. They were an enrolled agent with the IRS, also known as an EA. But she let me know that I could take a huge <laughs> depreciation deduction on the printer that I bought, the laptop that I bought, the monitor that I bought for my business, my office chair. Yeah. So bookkeeping really does help them see all that. And they will see, oh, you have all these fixed assets. When did you put them in operation? Big, big point. So you definitely want to make sure that you're keeping track of your fixed assets so they can give you that depreciation deduction that you are entitled to. Absolutely. All right. On to number three, bookkeeping is not, <laughs> I repeat, it is not a glorified data entry task because data entry specialists don't get me wrong they are some champions when it comes to alpha and numeric data entry i will never ever ever disrespect a data entry specialist not ever because what they do requires a certain skill set that being able to rapidly type in data that is both alpha and numeric in its individual sequences is a skill However, they cannot translate that skill over into bookkeeping because bookkeeping requires a certain knowledge of why is this expense categorized as this and not that. So let's take, for instance, your travel with your gas and your mileage. Now, most people would think because they used, they filled up their tank and they made certain trips through for business, but they also made personal trips that they could write off the whole expense for gas. No, you can't. Not on your business, you can't. A data entry specialist is not going to know that, but a bookkeeper will. So that's one of the huge differences. They know what is a taxable deduction for your business and what is not. They also can analyze your financial statement. A data entry specialist does not have the eye or the training necessarily to do that. So when you treat your bookkeeper like a glorified data entry specialist, you are devaluing the service that they give to you and their experience, which made them qualified to work for you in the first place. Does that make sense? Do you guys understand that? Yes. Awesome. All right. Any questions so far? Not at all. Wonderful. All right, Ty, I'm going to give you these next three slides because I would love to hear your input on them. Okay. So bookkeeping costs, do not equal 
software costs. Well, that ties into what Alita said in the previous slide in reference to the value of a bookkeeper, okay? Being not so much a glorified data entry. And I just want to piggyback on, you know, the, big, the bookkeeping costs and kind of let you hear a little bit about my interpretation of bookkeeping costs, okay? It's quite a simple equation that I came up with on my own, you know, with all of my 20 years of experience in accounting. Bookkeeping costs, and, I, and everybody who's listening or will be listening on, you know, the replay, the playback, however you're listening, want you to really understand what I'm about to say about bookkeeping costs, where it does not equal software costs. Bookkeeping costs equals less costs or taxes that you would have to pay to the IRS, okay? And what I mean by that is if you have an accurate and efficient bookkeeping system in place, okay, that can pretty much justify everything that you as a business owner report on your tax forms, okay, that bookkeeping costs can save tax taxes in the end because you are going through and reporting all of your tax deductions efficiently, okay? And bookkeeping costs translates to the value that Alita was explaining about, okay? Because that's really the value that any bookkeeper, accountant, CPA, or tax professional have, is the ability to set up the financial systems so that everything is reported accurately, in turn, allowing you to maximize upon your tax deductions, which in turn can minimize your taxes, okay? So bookkeeping costs have all of those things embedded, okay? Whereas software costs is just a matter of going and setting up the software to perform a certain task. For example, I've encountered a lot of individuals who even paid me to set up QuickBooks, okay? Went in there and set up QuickBooks, but what good is the setup of QuickBooks if it's not being used correctly, okay? So when we talk about bookkeeping costs, we have to factor in the value that the bookkeeper brings. And the main value of any bookkeeper or any accountant is the ability to not only just record your financials, but also make sure that you're recording the financials so you can take advantage as a business owner of the tax deductions that you are entitled to. Because there are many, and I can't stress more than enough, of the many tax deductions that are missed as a result of inaccurate bookkeeping. So, Lita, do you want to add to that or... Um, oh, no, anything? you nailed it. Like you, you 100% nailed it. And uh, a little unknown tip for you guys, your bookkeeping costs are tax deductible to your business. They are a professional service fee. They are deductible. So you get a tax deduction for your bookkeeping costs. True. Right. So Any you can, you can literally <laughs> write off <laughs> on your taxes if you paid your bookkeeper, say, 15000 a year for your medium-sized business or more, that's a tax deduction to you. Right. What, is, what is that cost worth to lower your tax liability to the IRS? Huge, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I wish I could pay myself so I can deduct my <laughs> services for doing my own taxes. So... <laughs> It, it's just it's just one of those things you didn't know that you could do that, but you absolutely can. Right. Mm -hmm. Did anyone who's uh, joining us on a panel, did anyone have any questions or anything um, you want to add or say about this slide here? Bookkeeping costs do not equal software costs. Does that just make sense to everyone? Yep. 
Yeah, do let us do let us know if you guys have questions. Um, I know, like I said, sometimes I get really, really passionate about this stuff because I I just love this area, and so um, yeah, I get to talking real fast, and so do let us know if you guys have questions. Okay, I agree. It just makes sense. Well, awesome. I'm glad you think so. Um, Ty, this this is your next slide. So, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. All right, let's I'm get ready. it. Ready. Sales tax tracking and reporting is required unless your business is exempt. Oh, boy. And uh, I don't want to put, I guess, on the spot, but uh, Debt C happens to be one <laughs> of my current students. Woo! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and we spent two weeks in class talking about sales tax alone. Now... <laughs> If you sell a product and, 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 and retailers, I see this happen a lot where a retailer may sell a particular product that they have in inventory, but not necessarily keep track of the sales tax. OK, so unless your business is exempt, you are required to pay sales tax. Now, just one of the discussions I've had in my class when we talked about um, the retail sector of accounting is sales tax is a liability, okay, or something that the business owes. So if the retailer would sell a product that they have in their inventory, okay, and they're required by the state or the municipality to record the sales tax, okay? That money that you receive from the customer for your sale, part of that is sales tax. So you have to put that money aside because you have to pay the city, the municipality, whoever charges you the sales tax. So if you are a business, okay? And you charge sales tax, you are required to pay that sales tax unless that business is exempt. And one of the ways that I like to uh, teach when I talk about sales tax is have a system in place, i.e. QuickBooks, so to speak, that's going to generate what the sales tax is from collections and put that money aside, like in a separate bank account. So therefore, when it's time to pay those sales tax, you have that money allocated in a separate account. Because I know um, I, some years ago, I taught one of my students, she actually, her, the company that she was working for, actually, she did sales tax returns. And she shared many stories of how a lot of these small businesses who sell these products, how they got in trouble with the state because they wasn't properly paying their sales tax. So sales tax is a key component if you are a business, especially if you are selling items. And I know now, especially with, um, with COVID, I see a lot of individuals starting online businesses, selling products. That's all well and good, okay? But you also have to think that if you sell product, all right, and you're not exempt, you're going to have to report on those sales tax. So that's just something always to keep in mind in reference to sales tax. So Lita, anything to um, add to that? Or? Yes. Um, digital products also are, they are, they have sales tax attached to them unless again, it is exempt in your state. Um, the fastest way to find out if you are in a sales tax nexus, which is what it means when you have to pay sales tax on a product or service-based business, is to check with your state secretary of state website. Because if you do not pay the sales tax, the state holds your business permits and license. So they can make your business inactive as a result of not receiving their revenue. So you have to make sure that you know 100% 
whether your service-based or retail-based business is sales tax exempt or exempt or not, and if there is a nexus on digital products as well. Amazon.com got into huge trouble for not paying the states their sales tax revenue in the states where Amazon was making money. So none of us are at, at, at Jeff Bezos level yet, but the goal is to get there. And so we get there by being smart and knowing where our liabilities lie in terms of our state and federal governments first. That way we are not in fire of, or in the line of fire of losing our business or being fined very heavily due to sales tax. It's, it may be a small amount, but it can add up to big repercussions. So do keep that in mind. And again, you can find that out if your state is in a sales tax nexus by going to your Secretary of State's website and searching sales tax. And just to add to that also, I, I find that software such as, um, I know, QuickBooks Desktop is real good at keeping track of all of the sales tax. OK, yeah, so keeping track of everything, you can actually run reports and what QuickBooks Online will break down is your total amount of revenue or sales. OK, but then it's also going to tell you the amount of sales tax that you should pay or, you know, that you need to set aside based upon your sales. So all of these things are in place to assist with sales tax as well. All right. Anybody got any questions on this before we move on? Um, I know we had a mention in the comments that um, Ari said she didn't know this, and that's a thumbs down. Um, why the thumbs down, Ari? What's going on? I just didn't know about that. Oh, I mean, okay. I'm virtual assistant, so I didn't think that we have sales tax especially since I'm not really selling like a product. Well, there are some states that require even service-based businesses to um, pay sales tax. So um, this is why it is definitely a good idea to um, check into that. I know I checked into it with the state of Iowa. Service businesses are exempt from uh, having to pay sales tax. But if I were to start selling any products, from my service-based business, then I would have created a sales tax nexus for my business in the state because I'm selling a product. So you definitely need to make sure that you are checking into that. And once you do, if you have any questions, speak to an attorney, um, speak to um, a tax representative or professional. They'll be able to explain that law to you so you know precisely what is needed for your virtual assistant business. So if you are in a state where you don't have to worry about that and you know you're not selling products, then very good to go. And I, and I know alone here in Georgia, um, there's sales tax per municipality, like Cobb County, where I'm at, may be different than Gwinnett County or um, Fulton County. So depending on what county you're in and where you're conducting business from, there can also be um, different sales tax based upon that. That's, that's what I know about the state of Georgia. So, yes, it, yeah. it, it, sales taxes, because of what Amazon got itself into, has become something that all of the people in the financial services profession are just wanting to make sure that all business owners of any size are aware of the repercussions of not getting this paid. So um, if you, like, like I said with slide number one, if you don't carry too much back from this presentation with you, please carry th those first two things. Yes, this and that it's, you know, your accurate organized books are necessary. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Uh, no. Carol, I see Carol says New York say no more, right? <laughs> Um, Ari, and um, since you're in New Mexico, like I said, um, search for the New Mexico Secretary of State or, or do in your Google search um, sales tax nexus New Mexico, and then you can start to get more detail by looking what's specific for Albuquerque. In fact, let me type that into the chat for you right now. And while, we're, while I'm doing that, I'm going to move on to the next slide for you, Ty. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Okay. I hope this isn't in the way, you guys. <laughs> well, I can see. Okay. So bookkeeping is the first step in fixing 
your cash flow issues. Really, Alita and myself can't really stress that enough. And I say that because a lot of cash flow issues along with um, certain other type of issues, but cash flow issues are really the first step in fixing your fixing or getting to know bookkeeping rather, because bookkeeping systems in and of itself will unlock a lot of the cash flow is issues. For example, one of the biggest uh, cash flows that I have encountered working in with small businesses and even corporations come from what's known as aging receivable schedules, okay? Accounts receivable. That's basically when you render a service or you sell a product, but you don't necessarily receive the cash at the time of sale, okay? How this becomes a cash flow is once you send out an invoice to a customer or a client, you have to be able to track that invoice. And if that invoice isn't paid, then that can present a cash flow issue. But the only way to see if that invoice was paid, okay, is to look at what's known as, you know, an agent receivable schedule. You know, we could definitely talk about that. But knowing where the issue occurred is going to help to unlock what's going on with cash flow. So if I'm looking, if I have a small business and I'm looking at their agent receivable, the first thing I'm going to look at to dissect their cash flow is if every month I see the receivables going up, that means that services are being rendered, but cash has not been collected. And you know, as a business, even though you may not be receiving the cash, bills have to be paid. Okay. So a lot of those things with cash flow comes from bookkeeping and having bookkeeping set up, bookkeeping systems set up in order to capture these things. Because the lifeblood of any business, rather small, medium, or large, it comes from cash flow. Okay. And a lot of cash flow issues in a business generates from lack of bookkeeping systems. Okay. Also, one thing that a real efficient bookkeeper is going to do every month is do what's known as a bank reconciliation. Okay. And what a bank reconciliation is going to allow a business to do is to explain how cash is coming in and out, okay, versus what hasn't cleared or what's expected to be cleared. So a good and efficient bookkeeping system, i.e. bookkeeping reports, can really unlock a lot of the cash flow issues. Accounts receivable that I mentioned is just one of the many cash flow issues, but the key to effective bookkeeping is to be able to analyze the business and understand what is causing cash to, in simplest terms, to increase and what's causing cash to decrease. Rita, anything to add to that? Um, I love that you broke it down with AR being the first step. Um, AR is abbreviation for accounts receivable because that's usually where most people have their first big taste of, oh my gosh, we're not making enough money. Um, I have a client who is having a cash flow issue because her invoicing is not consistent. Um, and we are working on correcting that right now. But when your invoicing isn't consistent, that also creates a cash flow problem before your AR gets to it, the aging report that Ty was talking about. So um, bookkeeping is, is, you know, a cornerstone of bookkeeping is consistency. We want to make sure that we're doing the same thing the same way from month to month. Now, it's OK to start introducing new things. Don't don't think that I'm saying, nope, you must be strict and have rigid lines. No, that's not what I'm saying. 
what I'm saying is, is the key is to be consistent. So if you're going to invoice your clients, invoice everyone. If you're going to take credit card payments only through a certain payment portal, stick with that payment portal. If they're writing you checks, make sure you get that check at least 50% up front. <laughs> okay, get it up front. That way, if they, do, if they don't send you the rest of the portion, at least you were given some of your money and then you can try to collect the rest. Right. But um, accounts payable is the second part of your cash flow issue because you have so much money going out. How do we slow that down? What is the expenses that are eating up our revenue? So that's another thing that a bookkeeper takes care of. Right. And I know I had a client before uh, I decided to go over, you know, the statement of cash flows and anybody who's taken any basic accounting course, you know, I know in my experience of teaching it, um, the statement of cash flows is very difficult to understand if you're not an accountant. Okay. But I've used the statement of cash flows and just to give you a little um, insight on what that is, what the statement of cash flows tracks is cash from three areas of business, operations, financing, and, in, and investing. Okay. So when I explained how the statement of cash flows really worked to this small business owner, this allowed him to really sit down and track how his clash was flowing in versus out. Okay. And being able to connect that with a balance sheet or a P and L is also helpful because this allows where, you know, your cash is being spent. So Absolutely. cash yes. flow is very important. And that's one of the um, main statements that I try to explain in layman's terms to really help a small business understand inflows versus outflows. Yes, Don't amen. You are preaching, Ty. And because that <laughs> statement of cash flows, your money is always, when in, in your business, your money is always in a state of flow. It is never one sided. Oh, we just got all this money coming in and rarely anything coming out. No, your money is always in a state of flow. And you're going to have lean months where there's not too much coming in. And so you really have to be keeping an eye on your statement of cash flows, your aging receivables and your aging payables. So that even during those lean months, you are still turning a profit for your business. That that's one of the key things a bookkeeper wants to see. We want to see black on your bottom line, not red. Oh. So we want to make sure that your business contains itself, sustains itself and that it's creating the life you want to live. We are just as invested in your goals as you are. So do know that uh, your MVB is going to be, they're going to be a cheerleader for your business. They're going to want you to say, hey, it's time for you to increase that price because I see you've added X, Y, and Z in value that will help you generate that black on that bottom line. So all of these things about cash flow are so vital. You want to know how that money moves. You want to know how that money moves so well. You can look at your, you can go in and just look at your, your check register for your, your operating expense account and be like, yep, I see that we've got a 10% increase. And you'd be so empowered by knowing that just by going in and saying, hey, we got a 10% increase in revenue last month. Your bookkeeper is going to look at you and be like, oh my goodness, you were paying attention to what I said. They're going to be, they're going to feel so good because what they're showing you is sticking. Yes. And, and we want that relationship. We want you guys to feel good about understanding your numbers. We it's our pride and joy when we see that light bulb turn on and you guys are like, oh my gosh, I get it. And your eyes get so big and that smile on your face. Yes. We live for that. Yes, so. and I have. I, I know I have. Wait, I had Amen. a client and they mentioned bank wreck. I'm like, yes, finally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's, it's like it's like we hit the like the uh, financial services lottery when you guys start like saying like, hey, why is it isn't it bank reconciliation time when you're reminding us of things? We love that stuff. So like we just said on step number six, bookkeeping is the first step to fixing your cash flows because it is you can't you can't go wrong with instilling a good bookkeeping system. You just can't. 
Absolutely. All right. Um, I want to give another little break here because I know those first six slides were really a lot. So if there's any questions or comments or a slide you need us to go back to and talk some more about, let us know, please. Otherwise, we will continue. I'm looking at the, the chat for comments. Oh, I'm glad you guys are loving the meeting. Thank you so much. <laughs> you yes, guys are yes, going to make me blush and cry in a few minutes. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm really passionate about this stuff. Okay. Um, any questions? Everybody still good? You with me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Desi. All right. Moving on to slide number seven. Your bookkeeping needs are not simple. Please, please, please don't ever think that they are because they are not. Nobody's bookkeeping needs are simple. Even if you are just starting out, your bookkeeping needs aren't simple. And I'm going to tell you the number one reason why they're not because you don't know what your bookkeeping needs are when you're just starting out. No one does. So they are anything but simple. I have seen, I have spoken to a lot of, a lot of people who came to me looking for services and they're telling me, oh, my bookkeeping needs are simple. It's just a couple of transactions every month. When you go into their bookkeeping system, it is chaos in there. They are not simple. They may sound, they may, you may think that they're simple because you simply don't know what you don't know, but they are not. So I, I don't want to have you guys um, making that statement to your bookkeeper because you're coming from a place of not knowing the depth of bookkeeping that your professional does. That's the only reason your bookkeeping needs are not simple because every business, even if they are in the same industry, they do things differently. So nobody's bookkeeping is even the same, which is why they're not simple. There is no direct line of uniformity when it comes to doing bookkeeping for business. For some there is, but not for all. So I just want you to keep that in mind, even when you're just starting out because you don't know what your bookkeeping needs are at that point, they're not simple. And they will only tend to get more complicated as you become more established in your business. Um, I see we have a couple comments here. Oh, everyone's still good. Good, good, good. Hi, your thoughts on this slide? Oh, I have many. <laughs> <laughs> Let them fly. Let them fly. Tom, Tom does not permit for me to go into the many thoughts I had on this, but the one thought that comes to mind when you say uh, your bookkeeper needs are not simple, um, it reminds me a lot of times when I used to you know, just throw it out there that, you know, this, this is the service that I offer and how important it is. But the one common question that I get from a lot of small business owners, and I'm sure Lita, you can relate to this as well, is the fact that when we mention anything dealing with bookkeeping or accounting, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, I need you to prepare my taxes. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Gracious. <clears throat> Listen. <laughs> you, you probably already know what, what I'm going to say about this. OK, if your bookkeeping system is just all over the place, you can forget about taxes being done because be done being done correctly, I should say, because any bookkeeper would tell you the first step to proper tax preparation is going back to bookkeeping in and of itself. So just when we talk about taxes and taxes alone, that is what makes your bookkeeping needs not being so simple. Because yeah. in order for those taxes to be prepared, whether you are doing a Schedule C, Schedule E, um, 1120S, or whatever it is you're doing, OK, tax preparation in and of itself is going to make this statement true about your bookkeeping needs are not simple. So on my YouTube channel, which I have a uh, few years ago, I talked about the difference between bookkeeping services versus um, tax services. And believe me, <laughs> bookkeeping services and tax services are two different animals, okay? But because of taxes and because of the many tax law changes that happens quite often, 
that's what make your bookkeeper needs not so simple in and of itself. OK, so the one distinction that is always prevalent and what I like to do is always explain the difference between the two. But taxes alone doesn't make bookkeeping that much simple. So that's my spill yeah. on that. <laughs> yes, Ty. Yes. Yes. 100 percent. I know it sounds like I'm preaching, like but, you know, I, I, <laughs> this is how I am in the classroom, too. But we, in a way, we kind of are because, like, yeah. and when it comes to business, mm -hmm. your your financials they are your bible. That is your gospel. Like, yes, you have a passion for the service or the items that you are selling, but when it comes to your business, whether it is making money or losing money, is going to determine how viable that business is. Especially if you have a plan to sell it when you retire, they want to know. What do your books look like? If that is an end game for you, if selling your business is part of how you retire or how you start building a different legacy, you want those books to be clean because any buyer is going to want to see your financials. They're going to want to look at your profit and loss. They're going to want to look at your balance sheet, your statement of cash flows. They're going to want to look at any key performance indicating reports that you have for your business. And Ty, you brought up an excellent, excellent point when you were saying that bookkeeping is it is the cornerstone, the first step in doing taxes. That brings me to a concept that I'm going to be teaching on called the true accounting cycle. For us professional financial professionals, our accounting cycle is whatever happens from the beginning of a transaction to the end of the for the end of the transaction every day for a certain period of time. That is the accounting cycle for us. But there is another accounting cycle for business, and I'm going to be talking about it. It's called the true accounting, true accounting cycle, and it's for businesses. So keep your eye out. I started posting the teaser about it. So I'm going to give you guys a clue. Bookkeeping is step number one. <laughs> Bookkeeping is step number one. So if you are talking about, oh, yeah, I want to do tax strategy and tax planning, and I want to make sure I have my tax liabilities, you can't do that without your bookkeeping. Hence, like all. Ty said, tax prep alone makes your bookkeeping needs not simple. All right. So are we good on this slide, everybody? Yes. I want to be checking temperatures. I want you guys to get fired up and start being like, Ooh, I'm going to be a numbers person. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. I want y'all to get excited calling your friends like, girl, we need to have a money Monday meeting. Money Mondays. <laughs> Money Mondays, I like that. Money Mondays. Money Mondays <laughs> or Financial Fridays, I have them both. Hallelujah, <laughs> I have them both. All right, moving on to our next slide. This one is a big one for me. <laughs> Do not micromanage your bookkeeper. And what I mean by this statement, if anybody has ever worked in corporate America, and I don't mean Fortune 500 corporate America, I just mean you had a W two job. Everybody's got that one boss that nitpicks every single thing that they've ever done and they have no clue how to do your job. You know what I'm talking about, right, guys? There are, people, oh, yeah. there are oh, yeah. people who do this to their bookkeepers. And so I put this in there kind of as a public service announcement <laughs> so that, <laughs> you know, once you start feeling good about your numbers and all of a sudden you want to, I'm not saying that you will, just people in general. You want to start saying, oh, but don't you need to do it this way? Or why isn't this? Hold on, take a breath and think about what is it that you're trying to relay to your bookkeeper and then ask, ch maybe change the approach with it. So remember what it feels like to be micromanaged before you start to get kind of, you know, in a tiff with your bookkeeper. Um, you definitely don't want to rub them the wrong way. Um, <laughs> because I know some bookkeepers who just will, they will leave you in the middle of a lurch. Like they're just, they're not having that. And I, I can't say that I blame them, but they won't even try a course correction move first. So I want you guys to be able to have your MVBs and keep your MVBs and no, your MVB, your most valuable bookkeeper should not be the person preparing your taxes just for checks and balances systems alone those those duties should be done by two people yes. two people so back to the point 
Do not micromanage your bookkeeper. Remember what that feels like and try not to do that. I know it's sometimes you're going to be in a rush. You're trying to get a loan. You're trying to get this, this funding approved. Those situations we understand. We know what that pressure's like. I'm talking on the off pressure situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And next up. Oh, did you have another comment, Detty? I'm sorry. Nope, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. Um, bookkeepers can help you learn how to read your reports and understand your numbers. I was actually speaking to um, a client on the phone the other day, and she was letting me know that sometimes business owners don't want to work with a bookkeeper because they are embarrassed that they don't understand what the reports are saying to them. I want you to hear me well when I say this. Do not ever feel embarrassed to tell your MVB or a potential MVB that you don't understand what your reports are saying to you because it helps us create a, a tailored experience for you. We want you to feel good and understand the things we are saying to you. We want you to know that we hear you and that we're going to do our best so that when you are looking at that report, you are following and understanding the relationship between your numbers, how projections work in your business, how they help you make decisions, how they can tell you my business is profitable. My net profit was, you know, I did a hundred, I did a hundred percent more in, in sales revenue for my net bottom line. That's after expenses. So we want, we want to help you. We want you guys to feel empowered. Ask us those questions. Especially with me. I'm as real as you can get. I'm sure you guys can see that. Real human being, flawed to death. And so I want you to know there's no judgment when you're working with me. If you don't understand, tell me. I will keep talking and trying to give you examples until you say, oh, now I get it. That's where, my, that's where I, I want to be with you. Right here. Like, y'all done watch the Martin show. I want to be here with you. So that's what we do. Ty, you got some things to say? Up, I agree 100% with everything that you just said. Our job is to help you to understand the numbers because the numbers explain your business. But being able to make proper business decisions comes from the numbers. And I know in, uh, when I was going through grad school, you know, I learned a lot about what's called the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But all of that, being able to identify strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats, a lot of that centers on financial knowledge as well. So being able to look at a financial statement, which is the lifeblood of any business, no business can operate without a financial statement. So being able to look at the financial statement and understand what that financial statement is saying can lead into understanding the SWOT analysis or any type of analysis. Right now, um, it's budget season. OK, I'm working through budgets. You know, I have various departments pretty much coming to us. And it's like, yo, we need you to budget this. We need you to budget this. We need you to budget this. But before we can put anything into a budget, we have to go back to the financial statement and see the impact of how this happened last year and what it's going to do to us this year. And mm -hmm. a lot of the other departments, they, they, they have an idea, okay, of what to put into a budget. But not really understanding the impact of what they're asking us to budget. So any accounting professional from a bookkeeper on to uh, all the way up to a CPA, okay? Our job is just not to just sit there and do the data entry, as we said a few slides ago, okay? But it's also our job and our responsibility to make sure that you learn how to read your reports, but also understand the numbers. Because those numbers that is on that report is going to lead to business decisions. And I don't care, and I teach about this all the time as well in my classes. I don't care what size business you have. I don't care 
uh, what you sell, if you're a nonprofit, if you're a corporation, if you're a sole proprietorship or an LLC. You're still going to generate reports. And for your business, you need to understand how those numbers work. Yeah, um, I, yeah, great. Just great, Ty. Everything about you, everything about what you said is just great. Like, you just have to. It doesn't matter where you are, what your, what your entity status is. You have to. And sometimes for some people, looking at those numbers is like looking at foreign language. <laughs> What am I looking at? It looks like a bunch of hieroglyphics. I actually had someone tell me that, that their financial report just look like a bunch of hieroglyphics. <laughs> so us being the financial linguists, we come in and we translate. Yeah. So if that helps you understand what this, the, the concept that I'm trying to get across, we are your financial language translators because that's all your numbers are. They're just the language of your business. Exactly. And we're here to help you. Exactly. Help you understand. All right. Our last slide for the evening. And this one is just as important for you to remember for yourself and your business as well as bookkeepers. But respect the boundaries your bookkeepers put in place. Respect their boundaries. If they tell you, if you have financial questions, please email, email. It leaves a trail. So if we have to refer back to it, we can. If they tell you that their office hours are between a certain time period, honor those. Because our time, just like your time, is just as important to us. And we need our downtime, too, especially during the months of January and through April. <laughs> it is heavy, heavy, heavy stress during tax time. And with COVID and all the PPP loans and the SBA and economic stimulus, it's going to be 2021 is all of the tax year. <laughs> so we, you really have to give grace to your bookkeeper. I know something, sometimes you want those things. You need to have them right now, but give grace and know that, that you aren't their only client and they are working as fast as they can. So they don't experience burnout. So they don't make any mistakes that could affect you. So just respect those boundaries. We'll respect yours. And to maintain the relationship, the mutual respect has to be there, right? So we want you guys to know we are here for you. We're going to respect your boundaries. You, we, you respect ours. That as long as that mutual respect is there, we'll continue to be, we'll continue to be beneficial for one another. And that's, that's the, the basis of the, the relationship between a business owner and the bookkeeper. It starts at respect. Absolutely. And I know uh, along these lines, I know when you talk about respect the boundaries that bookkeeper sets, I know um, in my experience, I've worked with a few business owners and they basically wanted my service to just be to set up their QuickBooks because they had some type of knowledge of it already. Um, and the one boundary that I a lot set is, you know, even though you know QuickBooks or you may, you may think you know it, um, chances are there are some things that you may not know or may not you know, quite understand, but don't make it seem like you know, we, that our opinion or, or, or our knowledge doesn't really matter to you. And a lot of times I found that working with some particular clients who, who know QuickBooks or think they know QuickBooks, they kind of step the boundary because they think they know it, you know, more than we may know it or certain things that we suggest that could make their QuickBooks better and more efficient. They kind of, you know, look down upon. So respecting the boundaries that your bookkeeper sets is very important because as bookkeepers and as accounting professionals, you know, we had to take Plenty hard classes yes. <laughs> in accounting. I know yes, I did. I did. Intermediate, advanced, and, and auditing, and, and accounting information systems, and all these things. Yes. So we know what we know a little something, especially mm -hmm. study for the CPA. You know, we know. Oh. So understanding boundaries is important because as professionals, you know, we are trained to customize any type of system that we work on any type of tax preparation that we do is customized to properly suit your business and make your business run more accurately and efficiently. 
Yes, you nailed it. Um, especially in, you know, in terms of the the respect level on the experience and education that we have. Um, I know sometimes, like, um, I know Ari said you're a VA. How many times when you've had a client kind of tell you something about your job that they don't really understand, how did that make you feel? Like, I, I just want you to imagine, you don't have to speak up or anything, Ari, but just think about how it makes you feel. And it, 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 it almost, and I guess it's personal for me, but it comes across as very hostile. Like, I don't feel any other intent behind that other than someone trying to make me feel small. And that's not a place that I come from when I am advising my clients. So I don't want to feel like that's a place where the client's coming from. So that's why that, that mutual respect and those boundaries that are in place, they're there for a reason. And so we, we just want you guys to keep cognizant of, of the boundaries you set for yourself. Please have them if you don't. <laughs> and the boundaries that your bookkeeper sets. Because I've had clients, I have this one client who repeatedly calls me on a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, a Saturday night. And I have repeatedly told this client, please email me. And they will not do it. This client is on its way out simply because he's a great client, but he doesn't respect my boundary. You're interrupting my time with my family or they'll call me and I'll tell them I'm in the car and they'll continue to give me important information that I have no, no way to take notes of or to remember. So I'll tell them, Hey, can I give you a call back when I reach my destination? They'll just keep talking. <laughs> So I want you guys to think about those little things that, you know, you have clients calling you for and, you know, and you're just like, I'm not, and you're trying to tell them that you're not in a place to have that conversation or, you know, it's the, the weekend and you're, this is not when you're open, set those boundaries and respect them when someone else does. That's all this slide's trying to say. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Any questions? Comments. Toss them out there. I want. I'm. I'm. I'm ready to start juggling. Toss them out there. I don't have any questions, but this was great. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you thought so. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, Ari, thank you. I'm glad you guys are enjoying yourselves. I was trying to keep it fun and keep it light. Um, but keep it my nerdy passion, so I can get real animated. <laughs> Uh, this, Try not this to have game. so much dry humor on, on my end, you know, it can be a little dry, but funny sometimes. So, uh, yes, accounting, I, I have to tell people. So bookkeeping and accounting is not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not like, so we have to find ways to make it relatable and to show that you can have fun with it. Oh, and yeah. Yes, Sammy, you do. You definitely do set those boundaries up front. In fact, they should be part of your standard practice. Um, the minute you sign a new client, when you send them their first onboarding email, it should come with, hey, this is how you contact us. These are our hours of operation. This is our preferred method of contact. This is how you send documents to us. I mean, the whole nine. Definitely set it up front. Um, right. Ari, we've got a contact slide coming up for you in just a moment with both our contact information on it. So you will definitely get that. Um, yeah, oh my goodness, you guys uh, keep those questions coming. Um, um, the one thing that I do love is automatic responders. They can also contain your contact protocols or procedures, put it in an automated email message. So whenever they email you, like they can expect a 24 to 36 hour or 48 hour turnaround. It's tax season. I'm, I'm telling them max 48 hours are going to have to wait before I can respond to an email. And so I don't know what the busy season is for retail sellers. Maybe it's Christmas. Okay. You're prepping for Christmas. Um, so you've got all that. Um, LaShonda, I'll get to your question real quick, LaShonda. Um, so when you're in retail business, if you've got clients still trying to place orders and you know, you told them, Hey, your Christmas orders need to be in by like June or July. So you can make that fulfillment process. So they arrive before Christmas, you got to have a cutoff date. 
And that's just a boundary that you set for yourself, especially if you're in a position where you're still hand packaging or hand making a lot of those retail items. And, um, LaShonda. And well, oh, go ahead, to, Ty. We get to, one thing about uh, boundaries that I have learned from my experience, when you set the boundaries up front, you know, and you establish them with a new client, those boundaries that you establish up front, they lead into good habits and it also, you know, leads into respect. Okay. Yes. So a lot of the boundaries and the habits, you know, if they're practiced, you know, in the beginning, they would tend to be, you know, good, you know, as you build your relationship with your clients. So, you know, the boundaries should be set upon, you know, your first initial meeting and consultation with your client. And of course, if your client, you know, doesn't respect, you know, your boundaries, then, you know, you have the right to um, not retain that client anymore. But I found that good barriers, setting the barriers in the beginning often lead to good habits. Yes, he's absolutely right. Does that, does that answer your question? Sammy, does that answer your question? All right, LaShonda. Yeah, you asked, so, oh, oh go, go ahead. Sorry, Sammy. <laughs> Um, no, so it does. My, the only issue that I'm having is that, so I help a lot of executive assistants in the real estate industry and they're working like 24 seven. And I will like, it's so hard for me not to respond back to them, like say on the weekend, because like, I know they're struggling and they're needing the advice. And so I'm just not really sure because I've gotten, I used to work every weekend, but I've gotten to the point with my boss that I can I have a hard cut off on Friday and I'm done. Like I'm not going to work that weekend. And so I just don't know how to like have that hard cut off with them because like, I know what they're feeling and that pressure from their boss. Um, can I make a suggestion for you, Sammy? Yeah. Um, if they're coming to you with the same type of questions, create an FAQ document or a link to an FAQ page and send it to them. Oh my God. That's amazing. That Thank way, you. that way they have that, they have access mm -hmm. to that and they don't have to keep coming to you with questions unless they are specifically, you know, individualized questions. But if they're all coming to you with the same type of questions, create an FAQ portion. Here's our FAQ. Have your automatic responders send them to the FAQ. Okay. Yeah. I really like that. That's great advice. Thank you. You're welcome. But Shonda, oh my gosh, I'm glad you asked that question because, ooh, girl, like Ty, you know, there's not enough time to permit. Let me tell you something. <laughs> there's a lot of barriers that come with becoming a bookkeeper and I will not, not own my bias. I'm 100% biased when I'm giving you this information. So I want to just give you that disclaimer, 100% bias. Um, I do not subscribe to the, 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 biz, the bookkeeper launch courses that are available because a lot of them do not teach you the basics. Most of the bookkeepers I know that have come through that course do not even know what the accounting equation is. And that is key. That is cornerstone. It's the first thing they teach you in accounting 101. So education is one barrier. The second barrier is experience. A lot of jobs in corporate America want you to have three to five years experience, but they only want to pay you 10 to $12. And they want you to have your bachelor's degree in accounting or the equivalent and experience is another barrier. So here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're going to take a bookkeeping course, <laughs> I want you to take the bookkeeping certification course by AIPB.org. And I'm going to actually put that in the chat for everyone to see. This is one, and I, again, I admit my bias that I like because it does teach you the basics. And when you're done with it, you can become certified. There's a lot of people that will not subscribe to certification as a bookkeeper, but I think it sets you apart as an absolute professional versus someone who is not certified. Experience is a great qualifier. Please don't think I'm knocking anybody, but just experience. But when you're coming fresh out of the gate with your bookkeeping and you have certified bookkeeper attached to your name, chances are you're going to get that, that job that you're trying to get or start your own business and get more clients that way. That again, my bias, my opinions. Right. And I'm going to piggyback on um, what Alita was saying to this standpoint. And I'm not going to 
market myself. Yes, I am. <laughs> I am going to market myself. Go, shameless plug. Go for it. <laughs> but um, when, it, when I talk about the, around the barriers, the one barrier that I see, and it may sound contradictory because they are the makers of QuickBooks, but when you sign up to take a, let's say, QuickBooks course through Intuit, who's the make, you know, who produces QuickBooks, okay? You take the course and they may show you, okay, when you go, this is how you enter an invoice. This is how you write a check. This is how you do X, Y, Z. But if you don't understand, like, the basics of bookkeeping, then you're not going to understand what happens to that invoice when you put it into QuickBooks. So in all classes that I, that I teach, okay, one thing that I always stress to my students is when you enter an invoice into QuickBooks, what is the bookkeeping behind that invoice? And when you generate a report inside of QuickBooks, what is that report actually saying? Okay. And that is the one major barrier that I see to becoming a bookkeeper is a lot of individuals think that, okay, I can just sit down and take a class on how to enter an invoice into <laughs> QuickBooks or write a check or do whatever. But if you don't understand what QuickBooks is doing with that report, okay, it's not going to be beneficial. And what I learned about Intuit in my experience is if you were working with QuickBooks, okay, <laughs> and you were, you know what I'm saying, and you were to call Intuit customer service, the people that you speaking to on the customer service end, they're not accountants, mm -mm. okay, they're not bookkeepers, they're mm -hmm. regular customer service people. I mean, marketers, all that, okay? So really understanding basic bookkeeping, okay, is, you know, the one barrier amongst many that I see is thinking that QuickBooks is the end-all, be-all, which is absolutely not. So you still have to understand some parts of QuickBooks. Oh, yeah. Um, and one more thing before Ty answers Sammy's question. Um, taking a course by Intuit, and I completely agree with him, <laughs> one thousand percent. Like I can't agree enough. Um, they teach you the how; they do not teach you the why. The why is what will make you a bookkeeper. The how just says, "Oh, I know how to use the software," but the why is what will make you a bookkeeper. So you have to. And again, y'all, I'm gonna be biased all day. <laughs> um, you have to go and get a classical classroom education to understand the why in the theory, because the theory is where you learn. Like I know the theory, and when you put it to practice, is where it sticks. So, does that help you, Lashonda? Does that answer your question? If not, we can schedule a coffee chat, and girl, we can go into all the deeps. <laughs> okay. We can go into all the details. Okay. All right. So, yes. Thank you. All right. So, Sammy, give a specific example on what I mean by what the meaning of the report. Absolutely. For example, okay, the three main reports that, well, there, there's many reports, but the three main reports that most bookkeepers look at is the P&L, which is the profit and loss, the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. Okay. So if you wanted to see specifically how your business has performed as far as, you know, sales and expenses, you will look at the profit and loss report because what that report is going to do is basically tell you if your sales exceed your expenses, which is going to generate some type of profit or loss. Okay. When you want to go to, let's say that you wanted to obtain financing for like what Alita was talking about earlier about a PPE loan. Okay. And the business want to see, or the loan, the lender or um, whoever, the financer, they want to see like your business, like how much is worth. All right. You would use the balance sheet, which explains everything that your business owns. 
okay? Yep. How much debt that business is in and how much equity okay, that business has, all right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to measure your cash flow to see where you're spending the money, okay? Your cash inflows versus your cash outflows, you will look at the statement of cash flows. So every report that you generate, i.e. inside of QuickBooks, that's going to explain some aspect of your business, okay? But looking at the report and understanding the meaning of that report is going to help you in number one, making business decisions, but number two, it can also help you in long-term financing. And probably the most important, you will want to know if your business is making more than it puts out. So every different report inside of an accounting system has a different meaning. So Sammy, does that sort of answer your question and make you kind of understand a little bit more clear about the meaning of certain reports? Because I mean, inside of QuickBooks, there's tons of reports. I mean, there, there, there's hundreds of them. Okay? And that doesn't even count the custom reports that you can make yourself, which right. is where that key performance indicator comes from. That's what a KPI report is. Right. And those KPI reports, especially for retail businesses, are just as powerful and just as instrumental as a profit and loss statement is. If you know you've got like 15 product lines, you want to know which one of those product lines is bringing in the most money. So if you're thinking of revamping something, you want to revamp the things that are either A, making you more money to add value to them, or B, you want to revamp the things that are not making you money to see if you can increase sales in those areas. But those key performance indicators about which customers wear or buying which product, oh, they can tell you so much insight about your business. Like, ooh, we just the possibilities alone are just phenomenal. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Are there any more questions? Because I'm so fired up right now. Shoot them too. out. Let's get it. <laughs> I am too. We're here to answer any questions. That's right. What advice would you give a small business that may not be able to afford a bookkeeper? I work with small local minority business. My advice is this network with, with more than one bookkeeper. I know personally, I like working with startups who don't have much because I have packages built exclusively for startups who don't have the capital to hire an ongoing bookkeeping service, but they do like I do offer training and consulting at, at some lower cost that will give them someone that they're building a relationship with. So my advice would be to, you know, have them speak to someone who offers training, who offers, you know, some type of quarterly consulting or monthly consulting that may be at a lower end fee for startups and um, get into a relationship with one. So once they start growing their business, they already have a bookkeeper who is familiar with how they do business and what their bookkeeping needs will be because they're already having those conversations. Does that help, LaShonda? Awesome. Yeah, we all started we all started somewhere and not all of us, you know, have the in, in intrusive knowledge, intrinsic knowledge that Ty and myself have accumulated when we started our business is we had this piece kind of cold. Like the financial piece of our business was solid. Um, right. And there's still things that we learn that are new every day. So we, we've all been in that position where we needed a service and we didn't have the capital, but we got into network with people. And right. sometimes if they've got a good service, um, they might meet a bookkeeper who is in need of whatever it is they're doing and they can do a trade for service for a certain amount of time. I don't recommend that being the standard but some bookkeepers are willing to do that, especially if your clients or the people you work with cater to a specific need that that bookkeeper has. Right. And that's also cost is also one of the um, main concerns when I started in this field. Um, a lot of clients were concerned about the cost and thought that they really couldn't afford a bookkeeper. So as a result, you know, many of them, you know, attempted to, uh, you know, learn QuickBooks on their own 
or they may have taken like a class at a, I don't know, community college or maybe online. But I know that cost is probably one of the most um, the, one of the most barriers that I've experienced in the bookkeeping field, um, you know, since I started in this business and worked with a lot of business owners. So it's, it's definitely a legitimate concern. Yeah, that goes back to that slide where I said your bookkeeping costs do not equate your software costs. There are there is a common misconception that when QuickBooks Desktop was, you know, all the rage, that the cost of bookkeeping should be about what it costs for them to buy QuickBooks Desktop. And that is not true because you're paying for more than someone who can operate your system. You're paying for them to have the know how to, in fact, do the job, whether it was on paper, in a spreadsheet or in the system. So when you are cost, if cost is your number one mission before you get to how a bookkeeper can help you, you're going to run away a lot of people who can help you. And then once you find that one who can help you and you're going to look in your books, all it turns into is that you had a cash flow issue. Right. For a lot of businesses who are ready to hire a bookkeeper, they have a cash flow issue, which is why they're so cost sensitive and they miss out on someone who might be fantastic at diagnosing cash flow issues simply because the first question out of their mouth was how much do you charge each each solution is a tailored experience no one is going to be able to give you a blanket set fee no or if you quote them a range they want to hang their hat on the on the range that you gave them and they don't understand that the more you find out about their their how their bookkeeping is the way it is that it's going to take more time and more, more things outside of the scope of work to come to correct it. And they might need an additional service. You didn't quote them before because you didn't know until you went in. So if any of you are seeking about adding bookkeeping services to your business or working with the bookkeeper, if they ask you, to look at your books before they quote you any price or start discussing price with you, let them because they're going to go in there and see what is wrong. And when they come back with a tailored experience, it's because they can, they pinpointed exactly what the issue is and the steps and the services needed to correct it and keep it corrected. Does that help any of you guys? So when it comes into price, you have to think about, do I really know my books that well? Could they be in a bigger mess than even I'm aware of simply because I don't know what I don't know? Right. And how do I know that my bookkeeper is going to be good for me or that they know what they're talking about? So these are things you have to be thinking about way more than the cost of the service. Right. Because it's the value that you're getting that you're actually paying for and not just the service. Right. And I've, you know, encountered a, a client um, a few years ago um, that I was working with where, you know, it was a matter of, you know, tax preparation. It was a tax preparation issue. And, you know, when me and her CPA actually, you know, dove into the problem, you know, we found out that a lot of information that was on her bank statement was not really in QuickBooks. The transactions weren't entered. And we even went a step further and found out that the individuals who she had working for her, who she thought, you know, was taking care of her invoices and paying her bills, it wasn't there. You know, it, we found bills just lying all over the place. So the bottom line is when you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, bookkeeping and putting everything in perspective. OK, it's all about knowing how all, if I can you know, summarize everything that we talked about as far as bookkeeping is concerned. It's all knowing that, you know, bookkeeping is an important aspect of any business. Accounting is an important aspect of any business. So at some point, OK, it's going to have to be utilized if financial statements are going to be prepared effectively. All right. Are there any questions? Any more questions? Any more comments? Anything you guys would like to share? I have another question. So I don't know how to like go about this. So some of the assistants that 
I coach and help, they work for larger real estate teams and that, that real estate team already has a bookkeeper, but I work with some other assistants where they're a super small team and their agent is just not ready to like pull the trigger and just get a bookkeeper. And their like struggles where they come across is that their agent is overspending. So their, ca- their cash flow is like, like say for gifting to like clients when they close or like for an event, what would be a good way to set that like boundary between the assistant and the agent? If she's like the one that's controlling those books at the time to be like, you're, you're overspending. Like we need to cut this back. Um, tell her that she can put her foot down at this point. It's time to put her foot down. Like, listen, okay. you are overextending yourself financially and it's going to come to the ruin of your business because it will without a doubt. Like that's the, that is the end game. If they continue to overspend and they're going to start borrowing from things that they should not be borrowing from and uh-huh. get themselves in some, some, some high level IRS SEC type trouble. Nobody wants that. So tell her she needs to put her foot down. And if she's afraid to do it, tell her to invite a bookkeeper to their next money meeting. Yeah. Especially if she's in relationship with one, invite them to the next money meeting. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and then like also too, just because like I'm on the lending side and we do a lot of our real estate agents like loans and, I mean, quite frankly, a lot of them don't really bookkeep that well. And come tax season, they're pushing off on their taxes because they didn't save enough for when tax season comes to file their taxes. And so I like see that a lot. And I've actually, it's just super random because they've been asking me these questions recently because of taxes. And I'm like, and my first, like my first thing I tell them is you guys just need a bookkeeper. Yes. But if you're not, then you need to like sit down with them and have that hard conversation say this much money needs to go away for this. We're overspending on events and how many referrals do we really get for that? So yeah, and I just, they wanted- don't need just any bookkeeper. They need a bookkeeper who specializes in real estate. And here's a shameless plug. I specialize in real estate. Um, I've actually okay. been working with real estate investors and landlords and agents for the last 10 years. And cause I work for the largest landlord and real estate investors association in my state. So this is, this awesome. is an area I've been living and breathing for almost 10 years. So they need one who specializes in that area. So they, so, you know, I can go in and for instance, and tell them, Hey, where is your, where do you stand on commissions? How are you, um, how are you closing? What expenses can you cut? What are just something that is completely unnecessary? Because I can probably guarantee there's a lot of personal expenses coming out of there that should not be. Okay. And you can do that nationwide. (laughs) <laughs> yes being a bookkeeper is great when i'm certified as a bookkeeper i am not state specific cool awesome that's good to know i'm located in arizona so yep i am i can i'm virtual baby can go anywhere um so, I love it. <laughs> so yes um and and i will um like i said i'm going to get to our contact slide i know um these questions are so good so but we have a contact slide so please stay tuned for that because it's got all of our contact information on it perfect thank you Um, Any other questions or comments or stories you guys want to share? Because I could keep talking to you guys all day. I'm going to give it maybe like a minute. Just to see. Um, okay. I know I cut that minute kind of short. <laughs> I know some people are leaving. Um, so some final thoughts that I want you guys to take away, at least from my perspective, value bookkeeping as a overall service after, you know, this, um, this presentation, you, you know, the kind of value a bookkeeper now brings to a business. Like you, we, we've gave you examples and we've kind of laid out that foundation for you. So when you go into a conversation with the bookkeeper and you're already valuing what it is that they do and you're looking for your MVB, you will only be giving yourself the best of the best surface 
and value. This is the difference between having someone like Picasso paint you a painting or, you know, some random five-year-old off the street. Cute, but it's not worth too much other than sentimental value. So value is where it all, all comes down to. Your MVB is called your MVB for a reason. Most valuable bookkeeper. So that's the final thought I want to leave you with. Ty? Yep, my final thought is pretty much <clears throat> bookkeeping you know is essential um it is something that is needed in just about you know in every business but if you are you know thinking about becoming a bookkeeper i can tell you and i'm sure a leader can vouch for this is you're definitely needed <laughs> because <laughs> my experience with small businesses you know they're good on the product service. They're well good in that. But when it comes down to, you know, bookkeeping and setting up proper systems to prepare taxes correctly, that's where we're needed. So it's definitely a market out there. And, and a good thing about going into the bookkeeping profession is you can choose your niche. You know, you can choose the type of clients that you want to work with. So if you're interested in a particular segment of a business, you know, you have that opportunity to work with those type of clients. I mean, I have a student in one of my classes now, she came and started taking my classes and she have a business, but after taking my class, she became interested in becoming a bookkeeper and helping women to better manage their books. So it's definitely an opportunity in bookkeeping. You're, you're definitely needed, um, you know, myself and the leaders here to share all, you know, whatever information that we can provide. But this is a service in an industry that is not going nowhere. Definitely need it. And now with COVID, the way how the world is right now, you can pretty much start your business from home and get clients all over the country and all over the world. I mean, I've networked with bookkeepers on social media from uh, Russia, Canada, Philippines, India, mm -hmm. United States. I mean, constantly I'm getting connections with individuals all over the world. So it's definitely a needed service and we're here to help as much as we can. Absolutely, 100%. All right. So, uh, oh, wait, we got some comments here. Oh, thank you, Sammy. <laughs> um, the slides don't have much of the detail. Um, they just, you know, have the, the 10 things we wanted you to know, like the, like the proof is in the pudding. So they say, so the, the great, the, the gems that you want out are actually in the, the conversations back and forth on the slides. Um, Ty, is this something that we is going to be on our, it's going to be on our Facebook pages. Um, I don't know if he will send the individual links to yes, people. I will. What's going to happen. Um, this has been recorded. Um, it is running on social media. I put the name of my YouTube channel in the chat, which is simplified accounting. So actually this is going to be posted on YouTube, but then I will also be providing the link on social media and I will be sending this to Alita as well. And if you guys do want those slides, I'll be more than happy to send them to you. Um, just, uh, yeah, hold on. Let me get to the contact slide and you will be able to email me and let me know you want the slide. All right. We're going to slide all over to that. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming to this presentation. As I said in the beginning, this has been something that I have been wanting to discuss for a very long time. And I am grateful that I was able to do so in a way that was entertaining for you guys and that it, it you know, that you got something from it. So um, thank you. And that my contact information is there. Lita Marie Hall, Accounting Solutions, Bookkeeping LLC. It's all the things. Um, Follow me on Instagram, Facebook. My handle is the same at AMH Bookkeeping LLC. So thank you. Ty? And I have in the chat my YouTube channel, Simplified Accounting. So feel free to subscribe. Um, I have my website, the name of my company. I'm Green Business Center, but my main company is Thailand Bookkeeping Systems, where I specialize 
more specifically in QuickBooks training. And I also teach Microsoft Excel courses to help individuals understand Excel to make business, better business decisions. Um, have my email and you can follow me on social media, Facebook at T Green GBS. And I'm also on Instagram at the Green Business Center. And I really enjoyed this webinar. Um, Alita, I'm definitely looking forward to hosting many, many, many more of these webinars with you. Um, Absolutely, you know, yes. The information you shared tonight was just wonderful. It really was. And I'm just so glad that we're able to share this information with not just individuals in the United States, but like I said, I get request on my LinkedIn from in the bookkeepers all over the world, okay, who's interested in, you know, learning this information. So rather you're domestic here in the United States or abroad, this information is wonderful. And every time I do webinars, I have a wonderful time. And I really appreciate you all being in attendance tonight. Oh, me too. And Ty, I can't wait till our next one. Like, I get so excited to do these. So I'm right there with you. Um, yeah. Again, if you guys want the slides, um, do email me at info at amhbookkeepingllc.com. That's two O's, two K's, two E's in bookkeeping. And I will send you a copy of those slides. Um, again, thank you guys for coming. I hope you enjoyed yourselves as much as I did. Um, this is a blast. And I can't wait to see you all next time. Great. Well, everybody, have a wonderful evening, and I'll see you at the next webinar, and I'll also see you online. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.